Why don't we open up our Bibles then to the book of, what book? 2 Corinthians, good job. Chapter 1, we're going to be looking into verses 12 through 24. Verses 12 through 24 will then be looking into us. That's how the Word of God works, right? I'm calling this teaching, Arriving at a Mature Faith. And now, look, I think we all would, would love to be considered by other people as being mature, right? We want to be considered as being mature. I mean, don't you want to be known for having some settled wisdom? And that the gray, if you have any gray hairs, that you've actually earned them and you've picked up some wisdom along the way. We probably all want to be known for being a responsible person somebody that other people can turn to and can get some good solid advice, some good word from the scriptures. We all want to be known for having integrity. That's doing what we say we'll do, being where we say we'll be, telling the truth. We all want to be known for having lived a meaningful life. I think these things are very important. I think they go along with the word maturity. But let me ask, are you as interested in being thought of as a mature person as being a spiritually mature person? I think that's more valuable or secondary would be, I'll tell you what, you become spiritually mature and everything else will take care of itself. How does that sound? So let's first find out that spiritual maturity is to be the goal of every believer. This is from Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. It reads, These are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Here we go. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be, keyword, mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Now that should set us back a little bit because I think that it's a very beautiful it's a very high, lofty, it's a very, very much a holy goal, wouldn't you say so? Spiritual maturity is the desire of every true believer. I say that it is the destination that we are all moving towards, but yet it is an arrival point which we never completely reach. But that doesn't stop us from pressing on, does it? Got a quote here from Billy Graham. Billy Graham said, God's word is clear in teaching that those who follow him are to become more and more like Jesus. For whom God knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's Romans 8, 29. Billy continues, we may think that the word image means what someone looks like on the outside. But Jesus wants to change us from within, taking away everything that dishonors him and replacing it with Christ's love and Christ's purity. So here's spiritual maturity in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, it is to show forth the love of Christ to everybody we come in contact with. That's true spiritual maturity maturity. Will we ever reach this goal? No. Not in this life. Not in this world. Oswald Chambers gives us a definition of spiritual maturity. He says, it is not reached by the passing of the years, but by obedience to the will of God. And to that I say amen. There's a lot of growth that takes place when we determined to follow the Lord and his word, determined to, to reach out and touch God, because God's out to reach and touch our hearts, isn't he? He does that all the time. He loves you. 
He calls you. He wants you to know him. That's a beautiful thing. And my beloved friends, as we grow in spiritual maturity, it will become more and more obvious that it is God who is doing the work in us. And spiritual maturity, again, will not happen overnight. It is not like instant coffee. Just add a little bit of water. It is actually a slow, steady process that requires time and requires our focus. It was Alan Redpath who wrote, The conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. The manufacture of a saint is the task of a lifetime. We are to know, to be confirmed in our hearts, that God wants to build into each one of us. God wants to build into you. He's wanting to do that right now during this teaching. A maturity, a stability of character that will hold up through every single challenge of life. Often the Apostle Paul was under one sort of attack or another, wasn't he? What an amazing life that man led. Yes, he experienced great revivals. Hallelujah. But he also experienced it at great personal cost. Yet that never deterred him from sharing the love of Jesus wherever he went. It's going to cost us. Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, I want you to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after me. Yet how painful, as we go into the verses we're looking at, How painful it must have been for the Apostle Paul to be falsely accused. Have you ever been falsely accused? No, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. I didn't say that. I didn't go there. I think we've all faced situations like that, perhaps even on the job or maybe even in your own family. Paul the Apostle was being falsely accused by his church family. They were questioning him. They had misunderstandings, a lot of them, in the Corinthian church. And what's interesting is that it is a church that he hasn't established. The people that he brought to faith, not all of them, but some of them. You remember that 1 Corinthians, very much a letter of correction. In some ways, there was a lot of love in there, but in some ways he had them on blast, didn't he? He was like, this is wrong, and that, that's, oh, goodness sakes, you need to change the way you're doing this, and, and that's not going to work. And back and forth, he went with them. Well, some of them loved it. Some of them were like, oh, my goodness, you're right, and, and I do want to serve the Lord and follow. But there were others who did not want the Apostle Paul to speak into their lives. They were uncomfortable with it. If you're uncomfortable with the Lord speaking into your life, well, I want you to get used to it. (laughs) Because God loves you and he's shaping you and forming you into the image of Christ. So I want you now to please follow along as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses, I'm just going to read 12 through 18. And then we'll come back and talk about it. Paul the Apostle writes, For our boasting, this is what he's proud of, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, and in this confidence, I intend to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. To pass by the way of Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I planned, 
Do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and then no, no? But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father, I, I, we want to stop now and we ask that you would help to prepare our hearts, that our hearts would be provided to you as good soil for you to implant the word and that it might bear fruit, Lord. Fruit in our own lives, fruit in the lives of those around us, fruit that can be seen by others as your work within us. So bless us now, Lord, as we begin now to ingest the word of God. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Everybody says, amen. So let me first set the stage just a little bit before we get into what these verses are about. We are looking at a spiritually mature man. Uh, yes, that would be the Apostle Paul. And what he is doing is he is dropping wisdom on a basically immature church family. Paul had some real detractors. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and he had given them corrective instructions in his what we call 1 Corinthians. But again, some just didn't want to hear it. Paul had spent a year and a half in Corinth establishing that church. And I'm sure he was, you know, very intent on his teaching. His teaching is very orderly. It's very God-centered. It's very life-giving. And he had spent that year and a half with them. And now that he's been away in Ephesus, he finds that they're involved in lawsuits, suing each other within the church family. He finds out that there's sexual immorality in the church, that there's drunkenness, that they're mixed up in the area of spiritual gifts and what they are and how they operate. And they're even mixed up about what love is, where we get 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, which makes me kind of glad in certain ways that they were mixed up because then we get the benefit of Paul the Apostle writing in each one of these areas and we get to benefit from them. So uh, let me give you the very first lesson that I come to in this because Paul had detractors there in Corinth. Here it is, you ready? Church family, stay, remain teachable. I heard somebody that say to me one time they hadn't been to church in a long time. I asked her, how come? She said, I've already read the Bible. <laughs> to those of you that have been through the Bible a number of times, how much deeper does it get every time you go through? There's another layer, there's another depth, there's another thing that God will reveal to us that the Holy Spirit wants to work in us. So stay teachable. I actually live by that. You see, I am ever the student of the Word of God, and sometimes out of the grace of God, He allows me also to be the teacher. And as I have expressed to you before, when we're diving into the word, I sit right next to you. I'm with you as we are receiving the word of God. So uh, we're desiring to be spiritually mature. Paul the Apostle is going to be talking about that in here. Let's find out. Look at verse 12. Great, great verse. Verse 12 says, for our boasting, so here's what he's proud about, is this. The testimony of our conscience Conscience is a powerful thing, isn't it? It can, it can tell on us. It can encourage us one way or another. We can even have self-talk within our conscience. That's the right thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. Or maybe you say something and then your conscience, you know, your conscience speaks to you to go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> our conscience is a very strong thing in the area of good and bad, right and wrong, especially when that conscience has been developed and corrected and used by the Holy Spirit. But he says, we have a testimony of our conscience. So Paul's going to tell us that his conscience is pure. Here it is. That we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity, in godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. I want you to think of this for a moment. 
Paul the Apostle responds to some of these folks that are not very happy with him, but he does it in a very loving and grace-giving manner, doesn't he? I mean, you look at that verse and you think, that's his comeback to some people who are doubting his veracity. He's not delving into an argument, but instead, and he's not condemning them, but instead he is saying, church, this is how I live. I think we'd want anybody who is before us with the word of God or giving a testimony, we would want that person to be able to say, I'm living in simplicity before God. I'm living in godly sincerity. Simplicity is to say, I'm living an uncomplicated life. You know, in my years, and in the number of people I've met, the most powerful people I know are the people who live a very simple, straightforward life. It's like you know where they stand. You know they're not up to anything. You know they're not operating by what Paul the Apostle calls fleshly wisdom. No, I just want to live a life that pleases God. And they are focused. And they have that ability to stay on course and not let the troubles of the world blow them off course. I don't think that you can beat a life that is quietly, daily, intentionally lived out in a focused walk with Jesus Christ. Not too long ago, I heard the testimony of a man, and he called himself an out-of-control drug addict. And he said he was so far gone that every single day he had to have some kind of narcotic, and he would do whatever it would take to get it. And then he said, when God set me free from that life, he said, how could I live in any other fashion but as committed to Christ more than I was committed to drugs and in living my own life? That's the idea, that you're uncomplicated, that you're focused, and that you're not living by fleshly wisdom or always trying to please your flesh, but you're living to give glory to God. I could hear the sincerity in his voice. I could hear the genuineness in his voice. I could hear that there were no pretense in his voice. What he said was what he did and who he was. What better thing? So let's grow in spiritual maturity, being in simplicity and in godly sincerity. You know, that word sincerity is an interesting word. It's actually made up of two words. And the two words are without wax. <laughs> you go, my goodness. <laughs> uh, sincer I'm to live sin in sincerity. Does that mean I'm to live without wax? Here's, here's how that worked. In the ancient world, when somebody would make uh, a nice piece of pottery, or they would make some kind of a dish, or whatever have you. If it broke, they would be out of business, right? So what they would do is they would mix up some wax, some clay, a little bit of dirt, whatever color the pots were, and they would glue it back together with the wax, so that it didn't look like there was a break in it. But what would happen when it would get warm? It would melt and the pot would fall apart. <laughs> That's us. Well, we're all cro cracked pots, aren't we? <laughs> but besides that, it's the Lord who, 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 who does not want us to live in some kind of a fake fashion. So what would happen is then people would, if they were going to buy something, they would always hold it up to the sun to make sure that there was no cracks in it. And, and we're to live in sincerity, truthful, open honesty before the Lord, you know, not having to, oh, what was, what was the story I told? Do I have to cover myself, you know? Uh, you don't have to worry about those things. You're just very straightforward and simple in the way you live before God. So, <clears throat> uh, not with pride, and the first attitude that he has is by the grace of God. Look at verse, uh, I want to drop all the way down to verse 17. 
You know, you, you may wonder, I was trying to learn this for myself as I was studying this. The way that Paul responds to people who are not accepting what he is giving them as godly wisdom. How do you deal with that? And I was thinking to myself, what situations have I been in like that? Well, I, I'll, I'll give you a couple. Uh, I thought of it at, with my own kids. And maybe you can think about it with your kids too. Aren't there times when you just know how they should be and how they should act? And you try to tell them, they, they push back against it, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to be like that, you know. And I thought, how did I respond to that? Or maybe even in a work situation when somebody didn't want me to do something or I wanted them to do something and they pushed back against me. How, you, we usually respond in anger, don't we? We usually respond, you're wrong and I'm right. And what we're seeing in the world today is a whole lot of that, aren't we? Well, the Apostle Paul had some people in this church who were saying, we're not listening to you, you're wrong. We're going to see in a moment. They're going to tell him you can't be trusted. And how does he respond? He responds to them in grace. He gives back to them blessings. He tells them to begin with, my boast is you, and your boast will be me as we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on that day. And so I thought to myself, if you're in a disagreement with somebody, maybe even somebody within the church family, maybe somebody who you know, doesn't want to hear from you, how should you respond to them? With negativity or you know, with some force? Or should you respond to them with grace? And how can you do that? And then I thought to myself, what does Paul the Apostle do? He says, on that day when we stand before Christ, so if you could think of somebody that you're at odds with, it doesn't matter who they are. Think of the day that the two of you there standing together before the Lord Jesus Christ. How will you be then in the presence of the King of Kings? How will you be then as the Holy Spirit's presence is so powerful, as Jesus Christ is there, as the glory of the Father is around you? Are you going to turn to them and say, how dare you speak to me that way? <laughs> or will you say to them, you know, something with grace in it, something that has merit and value in the kingdom of God, that may be a help to you. It was a help to me as the Lord showed that to me. Look at verse uh, 17. It begins, Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? This gives us an insight, a beginning insight, into what their accusation was against the Apostle Paul. In that word, lightly. I think he's using that in this manner. Did I do what I said I was going to do? Did I do it lightly? The word lightly here speaks of being double-minded. It speaks of talking out of one side of your mouth and talking out of the other side of your mouth. And I cannot think of anybody that I've ever been exposed to other than the Apostle Paul who wishy-washy or lightly or, I mean, his letters are fantastically planned. They're exact. They're purposeful. Everything he did was purposeful. So he's kind of like saying, you're calling me lightly? You're calling me as being not double-minded, that's what that speaks of. Look at the rest of 17. Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. That's kind of like back and forth. One day it's yes, the next day it's no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. <coughs> I, I, I'm not somebody who switches back one way or the other. When I say it, that's what I mean. That's that simplicity that he's talking about. That's that godly wisdom that he's talking about. <clears throat> he's saying, I spoke straight on. I was never two-faced with you or spoke in a forked tongue. 
If someone does not tell the truth or says one thing and does another, how could you ever trust them? Right? And so Paul the Apostle is saying, that's not me. I speak the truth. As a matter of fact, truth is not a thing. Truth is a person. And his name is Jesus, and that's who we follow. And when it comes to spiritual maturity, honesty and integrity and faithfulness, they are paramount to a person's life. Thanks. I think it's the change of weather. Don't you think so? <clears throat> Sometimes my throat gets a little foggy lately. Without these attributes of honesty, integrity, faithfulness, without these attributes fixed as a goal in our life, how could we ever call ourselves spiritually mature in Christ? Verse 19 says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Catch this, verse 20 is beautiful. For all the promises of God in him, that's in Christ, are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Paul is saying that the message that we brought to you, the gospel that we shared with you, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and telling us what is ours in Christ. There's nothing wishy-washy about it. There's nothing double-minded about it. In other words, Paul is saying, I not only preach the gospel, I live the gospel. <laughs> I live the truth and integrity of the gospel. And everything that's in the gospel, in Jesus, is yes and amen. So this is like Paul doing this interesting thing. Again, I suppose it could be looked at as a way to deal with somebody that there's some contention between you. Because what Paul does here is a beautiful redirect. He originally told them in 1 Corinthians, I plan to come visit with you. And if I can, I'm going to stay with you for a while. But then he added the words, as the Lord wills, which is what we should add to everything we say, right? I'm going to go, I'm going to stay, I'm going to be this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to study this, I'm going to get that degree, as the Lord wills. I'm going to marry, I'm going to move here, as the Lord wills. I'm going to buy that car, as the Lord wills. So we are looking in everything that we do for God's will. And Paul pivots then from what they're saying about him to the gospel that he lives out. And he's saying everything, every promise that we have been given in Christ is yes and amen. <clears throat> our forgiveness from the Father of our sins in Jesus, it's yes, you're forgiven. And amen, it's done, so be it. The love of the Father in Jesus is yes and amen. Does God love you? Yes, amen, he does. Salvation, eternal life, resurrection, joy, abundant living, all that the Father has promised in Jesus is yes and amen. <clears throat> I remember years ago, Pastor Mike really liked that verse 20. <laughs> I heard him repeated a number of times, and sometimes in his prayers, he would say, Lord, I know with you it's yes and amen. All the things that God has for us. That's some place where you can park your faith, yes? Charles Spurgeon writes the following about that verse 20. <clears throat> he said, we might never have had this precious verse if Paul had not been so ill-treated by the men at Corinth. They did him great wrong, caused him much sorrow of heart, Yet you see how the evil was overruled by God for good. And through their unsavory gossip and slander, this sweet sentence was pressed out of Paul. Nicely written, huh? Don't you want that to be said about you? 
when you're pressed by the circumstances of life, when perhaps somebody presses you, does you wrong, again, at school or in your family or at church or at work, you get pressed. You get done wrong like the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't you like in the end for what has come out of you would be something good? That's what the Lord wants. So you know that verse, Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for the good. I think that we should kind of adopt this where we say, I cooperate with God in making everything good that comes out of my life. That's where I want to be. That's how I want to live. Lord, I want to work with you that even if something comes against me oppressive, that what will come out of me will be the grace of God, will be a turning towards God, will be something that works out for the good. And if the yes and amen were not enough, <laughs> these next two verses are really where I wanted to come to before we get to communion. So look at verses 21 <clears throat> and 22, and you might want to mark these in your Bible. Very, very important verses. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. I would say that you can take these two verses and make them a beautiful place in which to drop your anchor, your life anchor. Let it be rooted in these two verses. Let these two verses be to you an encouragement. Let them be a confidence builder in what God has done and is doing in your life, an anchor for your spiritual maturity. Because Paul here gives to you and gives to me three aspects of the working of the Holy Spirit within our lives. First, we are anchored, we are, excuse me, we are anointed by the Holy Spirit. Second, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And third, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. Watch how beautiful this comes together. The idea behind anointed is that we are prepared and we are empowered to do service for God. In the Old Testament, we see that prophets and priests, and the high priest in particular was anointed, right? Are you familiar with the high priest being anointed? When the previous high priest would die, and the new one would come along, the next one in the family, they would anoint him. He was anointed with oil. And that anointing was put on his ear, it was put on his thumb, and it was put on his big toe. <laughs> and you look at that and you go, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, it tells you the anointing that he received was to hear from God that that was the biggest thing in his life, to hear from God, even to the exclusion of focusing on other things. You see, the ear is a tremendous gate into our hearts and minds. The ear is an ear gate, and we need to think of it that way. So we need to pay attention then to what things we are allowing in through that gate. And when we allow God's word, God speaking to us, to come in through the ear gate, what happens? Faith is what happens. We hear God's word. It's powerful and alive. And as it comes into us and speaks to us about what God's promises are towards us, which are all yes and amen, which comes into us with all the things that God wants us to do, that's an anointing. So what we hear from God will direct what we do. That's the anointing on the hand. And it will also direct where we walk and the way in which we walk because they anointed the big toe. <laughs> Anybody need their big toe anointed? <laughs> so that where you walk and where you go, the things that you do, the manner in which you live your life would be that which is directed by the Holy Spirit. That's the anointing. The next thing <clears throat> 
it says, is that we are sealed. In the first century, and actually previous to that, what would happen is, say you were sending something someplace. Say you were a king and you were sending something someplace. The container in which you were sending it would be completely sealed. And then the wax would be poured over it. And then the king would actually take his ring and would press it into the wax. And that's the seal. And so by the seal, you could tell who the package belonged to and where that package was meant to be delivered to. And to mess around with that package, you would have to answer to the one who, is, who had put the seal on it, right? Well, this is saying that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's like God has imprinted upon you by the Holy Spirit that you belong to him and he belongs to you. So now, if I'm acting in spiritual maturity, if I'm following the Lord, I'm hearing, I'm doing, I'm walking, and I realize who I belong to. You know, years ago, uh, when I was in high school, we had these t-shirts, and uh, I th I'm sure they were mass-produced for a lot of different schools. And all it said, it was a, it was a circle, and in the circle it said, property of, and then I guess you'd write your name or the name of your school in, the, in that, you know, in that space. Well, it's as though you have been sealed and, and you should all be wearing t-shirts that say, property of the Lord Jesus Christ. You belong to the Lord. And, and just as wonderfully, he belongs to you. He's your God. You have this... You have this unity with him that you're growing into. And it's the Holy Spirit who's making it possible. I remember hearing somebody pray a number of years ago, and the prayer was a very simple one, but it was very powerful. And the prayer was, Father, I'm asking that you would remove from my life those things that need to be removed, and you would add to my life those things that need to be added. And in the area of spiritual maturity, it would be, Father, take away from my life those things that are offensive to you, anything that would hurt my relationship with you. And Father, add to my life those things that bring in a fullness of my relationship with you so that I might more enjoy you, so that I might better work for you and live for you and see wonderful things happen in my life, things that I never had expected before. So we're anointed, we are sealed, and then number three, one more insight to bless us is the word guarantee. The Holy Spirit is, made, is, is given to us as a guarantee. Now, in the Greek, it's the word Erebon. Erebon is a word that's used today in some cultures. Erebon is used in the giving of an engagement ring. So you see a gal, she's got an engagement ring on, and that they might say to her in that language, oh, I see your boyfriend gave you an Erebon. He gave you an engagement ring. And in that engagement ring is the promise we're going to be together for the rest of our lives. We love each other and are promised to each other. It's almost as though you could look at an engagement ring as a down payment, as a promise given, and in the end, the two become one <laughs> in a full way. So the engagement ring, the arrow bond, the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Here's another way to think of it. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a down payment. How's that? Have you ever bought a car and said, well, here's, here's my down payment on the car, you know? And, uh, or have you ever put something on layaway? 
How about that? Remember those days? I actually had a guitar on layaway one time. Kept adding money till it was my guitar. You're on layaway. <laughs> and how do you know you're on layaway? Because the Holy Spirit has been given to you. At the point that you give your life to Christ, that you put your faith in what Jesus has done for you to forgive your sins, the Holy Spirit is given to you to dwell within you as an engagement ring, as a down payment, as a layaway plan, knowing that that's how significant God thinks of you and that's how significant his purchase was of you. And yes, we have been purchased, haven't we? You've been bought with a price, not with silver and gold, but you've been bought with the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. That fits in so wonderfully with our having communion today. And let me leave you with uh, one last verse before we get on to uh, communion. And that's taken from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of this wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. Say a word of prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. It's, it's interesting to me, Lord, to be thanking you for this difficult time that the Apostle Paul went through. I'm not thanking you for the hardship, but I'm thanking you for the gold that has come out of it from you to us. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you. I want to thank you that you have anointed us, prepared us, and empowered us for service. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you that you have sealed us given us a stamp of ownership, preventing anyone else from tampering with what you're working on in our lives. And I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our guarantee of eternity to come. I lift up before you, Father, any that are here or any that are online that may not have taken that one beautiful step where everything changes that step where they say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and be my Savior. And all that's needed is for somebody to pray that simple prayer. Lord, forgive me of my sins. And at that point, your sins are gone, never to be brought up again. Thank you, Father, for that. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. My dear brothers and sisters say, amen.